those of you who may not know Atlantic, Atlantic is one of the, um, you know, the fabled um, legendary major label started in the late 40s by a guy named Ahmet Erdogan, a Turkish um, music fan who, also a songwriter, who with a $10,000 loan from his dentist decided to start a label because he didn't see a lot of um, American music companies putting out the music that he personally loved, which was jazz and blues. And so from artists like Luke Brown to Ray Charles to later Aretha Franklin, Atlantic um, became, you know, this legendary, um, legendary place in the history of music, um, you know, from the 40s until now, just, you know, you can kind of, without even thinking about it, just name the legendary acts that have come off of Atlantic from Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, to, you know, more recently, uh, you name it, Kid Rock, T.I., Lupe, Skrillex, Fun, Bruno Mars, um, so a little bit of everything. We're, we're uh, what's called a full service record company. So I'll tell you a little bit about my start, um, and then I'll get a little bit fast forward to now and tell you kind of some of the changes that have taken place between when I started, which was in uh, the late 80s, to, um, to now with uh, technology and changing habits. So I started out, I got very lucky. Um, I was telling Aaron on the walk over here that success I found in life is a combination of um, a preparation and luck. So you could be preparing your whole life for something and you never know when that moment is going to come where it's actually going to all, <coughs> all the dots are going to connect. And when I was a kid, I grew up around an hour from here in suburban New York, right outside of Manhattan. And I, um, from the age of 13 to 14 years old, I was obsessed with music. And I, this was way before you could go online and, and listen to anything you wanted. So you would have to turn on the radio and hope that you would hear the music that you wanted to hear. And um, when I realized that I wasn't able to hear everything, I figured that the only way that I could hear the music that I wanted to hear would be to go out and actually buy the records. And back then they were records. Um, and in order to do that, you needed money. So what I did was um, bought a couple of turntables and started a DJ business and went and played uh, weddings and bar mitzvahs and made a couple of hundred bucks every weekend, took all the money and went and bought records and studied the records every week, played the ones I liked at the parties, got more money the next weekend, went and bought more records. So I did this from the age of 13 up until ready to go to college. And when I went to college, I wanted to pick a school that had a really great radio station. And I ended up uh, going to a school in Connecticut and running the radio station for four years and booking the concerts and managing the local bands, all while studying English and education and ultimately double majoring um, in those two fields. But my passion was always music from the age of 13. And so that's the preparation part. Sometimes you're preparing because you're following your passion and you don't even know what you're preparing for. And um, I got the luck part is first day of freshman year at college, I met a guy whose best friend's dad was in the music business. And fast forward five years later, this guy who turned out to be a pretty famous guy in the business was starting his own record company and I got hired to be an entry level A&R person. So if it hadn't been for all those weekends, you know, lugging crates and, and amplifiers and speakers and turntables to to play, uh, you know, Sweet Sixteens, I wouldn't have been in that opportunity to know all the music. So I devoured everything that I could listen to. And for me, um, I grew up listening to radio back in the 70s and 80s when certain stations played all types of music. In the 70s, you could listen to music like, you know, you hear Barry White into Kiss, into the Carpenters, and for me, it all made sense. So, you know, fast forward 30 years or whatever it is from those days, um, that's how I approach what I do. Um, I love music that more people are going to like than less. I've always been kind of a mainstream guy. And with a label like Atlantic, you got a big overhead to carry, so you want to be able to um, sign 
bands make records with those bands and then give those records to the rest of the company to go out and promote and market and sell and um, do everything that we need to do to actually break these bands. So I started um, at a label called SBK Records in 1989 um, as a rookie A&R guy and um, basically just looked around and kind of took it all in and um, you know, listened to as many demos as I could in search of something great. And, you know, there's kind of a fine line between the, um, you know, the brilliant and the absurd. And um, so, unfortunately, the first hit that I had falls more into the absurd category. And you guys might not have even been alive for this, but um, I was working um, with this rap group in the, uh, probably around 1990. Anybody alive in 1990? All right, good. All right, we're, getting, we're catching up. So um, I got called into my boss's office, and he said, I need your help. I was the, the rookie, the, the kid. He's like, we're making a movie. And he hands me a script, and he's like, we have an opportunity here, because this movie could be a big movie. And, um, but we're doing the soundtrack, and we don't have a hit. And you know the history of music and film coming together, you have a huge opportunity to um, marry the two and, and really be successful. So I had visions as he's telling me this, I had visions of the great films of our time, of The Godfather and you know, uh, Raging Bull and oh great, you know, movies that were a taxi driver, movies that were able to, you know, merge music and, and, and picture. And he hands me the script. And I look at it and it says Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? <laughs> I'm like, okay, whatever, work, that works too. So I called the rap group that I was working with and I said, guys, got an opportunity for you. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And they're like, what's a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I said, I'm going to message her over the script. I want you to read it and see if you could write a song that reflects the script that maybe we could use as an end title. And two days later they called me and they said, we nailed it. We wrote a song called Turtle Power. Said, Great. I listened to it, we put it out, ended up selling 10 million records, was a number one record all over the world. And I was like, this is the easiest job, you know, ever, right? Little did I know. So um, that was kind of my start. And over the years, I've been very lucky to um, work with some brilliant artists as well as brilliant executives. My biggest mentor in the music business um, is a guy whose name you may know named Clive Davis and Clive Davis is as legendary as it gets. Um, so I worked for the first company which was a company called SBK Records. It merged with a company called EMI Records which is a more well-known name and we took on the EMI name even though we were running it. And that label was um, went out of business in 1997. I think um, at EMI is where I met Aaron. He was my intern. and. Um, so when the label went out of business, I needed a job, and so I got an interview with Clive Davis, who was then running the legendary record label, Arista Records, and got called in for an interview, and I sat down just one-on-one -on -one with, with Clive, <coughs> and had never met him before, and he says to me, so you want to do A&R for my record company? I said, yeah, that'd be great. He's like, well, tell me some of the music that you've worked on. Who have you signed? What are some of the, uh, the artists that you've worked with? And I said, oh, I, I worked with this group. I hate them. Next. Uh, well, I had that. Oh, they're worse than the other one. What else? And this went on for three hours. It was worse than Root <laughs> Canal without the Nova King, right? So I was like, this is the worst job interview. As it's happening, you know, sometimes you have the out-of-body experience. And I'm like, this is the worst <laughs> job interview I can ever have. You know, all my greatest nightmares are now, like, in flesh right here. This is horrible. And um, at the end of the meeting, he said to me, I want you to do some homework for me. I want you to put together some music. Put together, you know, a tape, a cassette tape of artists that you love that you would want to sign if you worked here. And songs that you think are hits. Again, the A and the R, the artist and the repertoire, you know. Songs that you think are hits. And get them to me and let me listen to them. And I'll, you know, get a better sense of, of whether I think you're a fit for the A&R department at Arizona. So, of course, that's what he was saying. What I was hearing was, well, I'm never going to work here, so maybe I could get a job at Columbia. Maybe I could get a job at Atlantic. I, I had totally tuned him out. And around a week later, I get a call from Clive's son, who was um, at that point an attorney, and he represented me. 
And he said to me, my dad called me and he wants to know where your tapes are. And I said, you know, that was the worst job interview I've ever had. I, I have no intention of, of making these tapes because it's going to be a waste of time. And he said, no, he wants your tapes. Make the tapes um, and get them to him tonight because he's going to LA. And I said, tonight? I've got three hours to make these tapes that are going to decide whether or not I have an A&R job with the most legendary guy in the music business. Okay. So I go, I make the tapes, I rush them over to Clive Davis's office, and then I go home, wait for the call. Six weeks later, nothing. So I call his son, I'm like, you know, you, you got some nerve here. It's like you, you made me kind of jump through hoops, I got the tapes, nothing. So he's like, let me, let me see what, what the problem is. The next day I get a call from Clive Davis's office, it's around Labor Day. He's like, can you come in and talk about your tapes? Okay. So I go in and he says, I wanted you to come in because I listened to your tapes and honestly I have no idea. They're so all over the place, I figured we'd talk about it in person. Okay. So he says, let's listen to your tapes. So he puts the first tape in, first song comes on, he's like, I hate that. Goes to the second song. That's worse than the first. So I'm like having deja vu of my worst time. <laughs> <laughs> this goes on for around three and a half hours this time. It's just worse. It's like, you know, forget the Novocaine without the anesthesia. This is somebody just stabbing you over and over. And over. <laughs> so at the very end, I'm like, you know, like, bruised and bloodied, I'm like stumbling to my feet just being, you know, shit on for three hours. And I'm about to walk out. He's like, we're going to make a decision on who we're hiring in around a week. We'll call you. And I'm like, yeah, right. Sure enough, a week later, you're hired. Can't make this up, right? So I get, I get to work the first day at Arista. This is now 1997. And I'm like, wow, I do A&R at Arista Records. I work for Clive Davis. This is amazing. But the thing that nobody tells you is there's no manual of what to do. There's no manual of what Clive Davis wants and what he doesn't want. So it's kind of like you've heard the expression of if you want to teach a baby to swim, some people believe you throw the baby in, in the deep end of the pool and the baby either swims or drowns, right? That's like working for Clive Davis at our school. So, for the first six weeks that I worked there, I was that drowning baby. <laughs> I was like, what about this? No, what about this? No. So I'm like, you know what? I gotta figure out how I fit in here because I think I'm pretty good at what I do. I've just gotta convince him. He's probably not convinced yet that he made the right choice when he hired me. So I was looking down the roster of artists and I was like, you know, there's got to be a fit for me and my expertise to come in and help Clive, you know, with his roster. And he had recently signed an artist right before I had gotten there in 1997, who was a really, really famous artist, but who hasn't had a hit record in probably 15 to 20 years. Still selling concert tickets, was still legendary, but nobody had had a reason to want to go take their money and buy his music in a long time. So I was like, you know what, this is kind of a, a project for me. This is like, I could probably dig in here and figure out how to direct this artist towards a place where people will give a shit again. And so what I did is I just decided I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna dive in, I'm gonna study, and let me come up with a concept that I can pitch to Clyde. So any great idea or most great ideas, are stolen from somewhere else, right? You get a little of that, you take a little from you, you take a little from you, and you're like, oh great, I can now take you know, these kind of germs of ideas, put them all together with my own ideas, and come up with something special. So there was an artist back then, a legendary blues artist named B.B. King, right? Everybody knows B.B. King. B.B. King had a record out in the late 90s called Deuces Wild. And I was always looking at the charts to see what was selling and why. And B.B. King's record <coughs> was selling more in 1997 than it should have been. And it turned my head. And I'm like, why is this Deuces Wild record selling more than it should have been? <coughs> and I went and I got a copy of the record. And it was B.B. King doing duets, Deuces Wild. He was doing duets with people like D'Angelo, Bonnie Raitt, uh, Tracy Chapman. Um, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And I listened to the record and I'm like, one problem, the record sucks, right? Great concept, flawed execution. If I can take this concept for this new artist, 
that Clyde, not this new artist, but the new signing of this other legendary artist that Clyde Davis has signed, we could probably be on to something. So I start getting really excited about this idea, and I put a memo together for Clyde. I had been at the company around six, six weeks, and I'm like, Clive, I nailed it. I got it. This is what we need to do with this artist. And if we do this, and I blueprinted it out, we're going to take the B.B. King idea, but we're going to make sure that we have younger <coughs> guests that appeal to a new generation, because this artist appeals to an older generation. <coughs> and if we get it right, you know, we'll get the right guests in, but we'll also make sure that we kind of set the bar so high in terms of the material that they ain't getting on the record unless they deliver a hit. So if they're inspired because they grew up with this guy's music, they'll deliver a hit, we'll do it as a collaboration, and we'll end up appealing to the parents and the kids, right? So I'm really excited. Anybody see the movie Jerry Maguire? You remember the Jerry Maguire manifesto? This was my manifesto, right? Remember what happened to Jerry Maguire after he gave in his manifesto? <coughs> he got fired, right? So I take my manifesto, my memo, and I put it on Clive Davis's desk, and I go back to my office, and I wait for the phone call to tell me what a genius I am. That was 1997. It's now 2012. I'm still waiting for that phone call. But when, the, when I realized the phone call wasn't going to come, I said, you know what? There are two things that I could do right now. I could get really pissed off really upset. Or I could say, you know what? Fuck it. It's a really good idea. And I'm going to do it anyway. And if he wants me to stop, he'll tell me to stop. So that's what I did. I called the artist manager and I said, hi, I'm Pete. I do A&R at Ariston. I have an idea for your artist. He's like, great, somebody at the label cares. I haven't heard from anybody in a couple of months. What's your idea? And I tell him, he's like, that's a great idea. I'm like, let's do it. And the artist was Santana. The album was Supernatural, and we sold 28 million records. So it just goes to show you a bunch of things. One, don't care what anybody else says. Don't be afraid of stealing the germ of a good idea, and then be able to execute. So what I was able to do is I was able to then you know, work the phones and call artists like Lauren Hill and Wyclef and Dave Matthews and Rob Thomas from Matchbox 20. and, and you know, it's so funny when you think about it. There was this one record that we did where we did... The, the other great thing about making a record with Santana is he doesn't sing. So you can do a duet, and the duet is not going to sound old because his voice is going to be the guitar, right? So you can put him with anybody, and he's going to sound current. And that's, you know, I think one of the things that we did right that B.B. King's record did wrong. Um, but back then, one of the records that we did was a three-way collaboration between Lauren Hill... Um, Carlos Santana and a guy who was like a rapper and a singer from a group called Goody Mob, CeeLo, before anybody knew who CeeLo was. You know, it's so funny how these things just keep coming, um, you know, full circle and, you know, fast forward 15 years, CeeLo is now signed to Atlantic and I have to work with him again. You know, it's kind of ironic. So here's the great thing about the music business. So we sell 28 million Santana records. We win nine Grammy Awards. Clive Davis has given himself a production credit on the record, which means that if the album wins Album of the Year, the Grammy goes to the producer. Producer, according to the credits, is Clive Davis. So that night, Grammys, Clive, um, Santana wins nine, Album of the Year, Santana. Clive goes up, accepts his Grammy. While all this is going on in the background, we've sold 28 million records, we have the biggest hit of the year. So what's happening to Clive? If there's anything I've, I've said to you in the last 20 minutes, he's getting fired, right? This is the music business. It makes no sense. It's illogical. But Clive's boss at the time, a company called BMG, a German company, decided that Clive was too old and that they were going to kick him out and bring in a younger guy to run the label Arista, which they did. The younger guy was L.A. Reid, who's now a, a, a judge on X Factor, right? So. Clive leaves, L.A. comes in, I'm caught between both places, what do I do? I've just had this massive hit record with Clive, L.A. is promising me, you know, fame and fortune if I stay with him. Um, and I end up making a, a big, big mistake, and I stayed with Ariston. And uh, Clive went off to start his own label called J Records. First artist that he signed to J Records was Alicia Keys. He did pretty good. <laughs> so. I end up at Arista Records with L.A. Reid. That honeymoon lasted six months. I get a call one day. We don't want you here anymore. You're fired. Okay. 
So now I gotta figure out a new job. So I got a call from a label called Epic Records. This is now going back to 2001, right? Anybody alive yet? Okay. <laughs> so I got a call from Epic, I get hired at Epic, pay me a lot of money, give me a big office. Day one, I walk into the massive Sony building on 55th Street and Madison Avenue in Manhattan. Literally, you know, I walk into the building and I'm like, oh my God, I just fucked up. You could just tell that I was used to Clive and I was used to A&R centric and I was used to creative and this was corporate and this was <laughs> horrible. I just, I get high just thinking about it. And so I lasted there a little under three years. The woman who hired me was a woman named Polly Anthony who was a radio promotion person who had ascended to the presidency of Atlantic uh, of, of Epic, sorry, and um, she ended up getting fired in a corporate bloodbath around three years later and all of her people, including me, kind of were shown the door um, right after that. And um, what you can look forward to if you want to join the corporate music business one day is it's nasty. You know, when I was fired, I was not fired politely. I was basically like, it's now six o'clock. By nine o'clock, if your shit isn't out of your office with you along with it, we're coming to get you. That was basically it. And you know the couple of years you have left on your contract? Fuck you, we're not paying you. Great, right, right? I love the music business. So, it all worked out. So, fast forward now, it's 2003. I've been thrown out of Epic Records. I'm like, what am I gonna do with my life now? I kind of like, I need to detox. So, I've realized what I'm really good at is making records. And, um, you know, give me an artist and I can help that artist find, anybody have a blank piece of paper? Now, 25 years in, what I've realized that I'm good at is that if the artist is here and their audience is here, my specialty is to help be the tour guide, you know, to help them figure out how to reach these people over here. So that was, and, and every artist is different. With Santana, it was like, you know, Carlos, don't record songs that are over 14 minutes long if you want them to get on the radio, right? Um, and follow my lead with the songs and the right collaborators. But it's always different. Every artist is unique. So I had gotten thrown out of Epic in 2003, and now it was like definitely one of these man in the mirror, mirror moments because I had been doing A&R for you know, around 15 years at the time and hadn't had a hit in a couple of years, and nobody wanted to hire me. So it was definitely, you know, fast forward to real life, I had a wife and two kids, and okay, who's gonna, you know, who's gonna um, pay the mortgage, right? So these are real life problems that you guys have to look forward to when you graduate from college. So. Good luck to you there. Um, so I realized what I needed to do is I needed to stay away from, you know, the typical get a job, interview for a job, get a job, get hired, get fired. That's not going to work anymore. What I need to do is I need to figure out why I wanted to do this in the first place and forget about all the corporate stink that was all over me and kind of detox and de-stinkify myself, right? So. I decided what I was going to do is something that I wanted to do for a long time. I was going to travel um, all over the country looking for new artists and songwriters. Start my own little record production company, start my own publishing company, and get back to what got me excited as a kid listening to music. So I decided I was going to take a trip and I was going to go to places like Detroit and Cleveland and Pittsburgh and DC. and hired a publicist and the publicist got the word out to all these places that hey this guy who's been doing A&R for a long time is starting his own thing he's coming to your town and he wants to give you an opportunity to help you and maybe sign you to his new company and so what we would do is we would go into each city and pick a club you know whatever the the right club was um, rent back line and basically give each artist the opportunity to come in and perform three songs. So I was listening to thousands and thousands of submissions from all these places. It was awesome. I was getting, you know, kind of like my, um, my groove back. I was like learning why I was really excited about this. But I, I skipped a, a, a key part here. Right before I was about to be fired from Epic, I realized that I needed to make amends with my old friend Clive Davis, right? 
because I, he had offered me a job when he left Ariston and started J Records, I had turned him down. And now that I was about to lose my job, I was like, you know what, I gotta tell this guy how much he's meant to me. So, because I learned so much from him, more than you could ever learn in a classroom or from a book. I mean, the guy's the best he's ever been. And so I wrote him a letter, very old fashioned. And I sat down and I said, dear Clive, just want to let you know I screwed up. I definitely should have come with you when I had the opportunity. Now, fast forward a few years later, I'm about to lose my <coughs> job at Epic. I'm not coming to you asking for a job. I just don't know what to do now. I'm kind of lost. So this was in October, and I sent the letter to him. And then I set off on starting this company and, and getting ready to go out to you know the Midwest and, and all these cities to go see some bands. And so October, November, December, I never hear back from Clyde. So I figured that my bridge was burned. I'm just going to have to make it on my own. The first city that I was visiting on my trip in 2003 was, um, or now 2004, was Minneapolis. And it was right around late February. And I was getting ready to go to the airport the next day, and the phone rings, and it's Clyde Davis. So I said, can you come see me before you go on your trip? I said, sure. So remember, I wrote the letter to him in October. Now it's practically March, five months later. I walk into his office. First thing he says to me is, that was a really nice letter you wrote me. <laughs> OK, I'm not looking at the watch. It's cool. You know. <laughs> so he said, how would you like to make some records for me? I got some artists they could use some help A&R-wise. I'm like, yeah, sure. He's like, so how'd you like to make another Santana record? I said, great. And he's like, what about Kenny G? I said, great, no problem, because for me, remember, you know, I was the kid listening to Kiss and Barry White and Funkadelic and, um, you know, uh, Bad Company. It didn't matter to me. I'm like, yeah, great. He's like, I want to do a duets album with Kenny G. Can you figure it out? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. So I went to Minneapolis with a big grin on my face because now I was an A&R consultant and I had the best client you could have in my back pocket because now I know that I'm able to call Atlantic Records, Warner Brothers Records, Capitol Records, Columbia Records and say, hey, guys. I'm working for Clive independently. I'm making records for him. Shouldn't I be making records for you? And that's exactly what happened. And so for five sublime years, I was my own boss. And every label, pretty much, pretty much all of them, maybe one or two exceptions, would call me and say, hey, we have a record. We don't know what to do with it. Can you help? I'm like, yeah, great. So that ranged from you know, starting out this Kenny G duets record was amazing. <coughs> because I was able to go out and do what I did with Santana, call people, I'm like, hey, would you like to collaborate with Kenny G? I got Earth, Wind, and Fire, I got Gladys Knight, I got Burt Backrack, I got Barbra Streisand, you know, how awesome is that? It was like, you know, a playground where you could just go out and play and, you know, get paid for it, it's awesome. Um, and then the next Santana record we did, we got more people, we got, you know, Will I Am, and we got uh, Robert Randolph, and we got Kirk Hammett from Metallica, Again, just you know, the most fun that any creative person can have making records. Then I started getting calls from other labels. Hey, can you make, can you, you know, can you make this record? Can you make that record? And I got a really intriguing call one day from Sony, ironically the label that fired me. Um, they said our strategic marketing division is starting a label where they want to sign heritage artists. Heritage artists are artists that are older that have a fan base but may not have connected with records in a while, kind of like our, our Santana um, example earlier. And so the guy called me and he's like, can you help me start this heritage label? And I'm like, yeah, sure, who do you want to sign? He's like, make me a list of every artist, heritage artist, who's out of contract right now. I'm like, great, so I give him a list of like 100 artists. And he's like, wow, this is a great list, do you know these people? I'm like, yeah, who do you want? He's like, get whoever you can. So started calling and we ended up signing, there was a brand new label, part of Sony called Burgundy Records, doesn't exist anymore, but back then um, I would became you know, the one man A&R department and I was able to go out and sign amazing artists. I signed Shaka Khan, I signed Aaron Neville, we made a soul record with the greatest soul songs of all time sung by the angelic Aaron Neville. Shaka Khan made a, a funk record with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis who won two Grammys, sold 200,000 albums, incredible record. Um, I signed my old friend, unfortunately, the late, great Donna Summer. Made her last um, studio album, an album called Crayons for Burgundy. Um, 
you guys are way too young to remember a great group from the 70s called America, made their last record. Um, and what we were able to do with America is we were able to kind of like, we called it the Cool Kid Supernatural, where we got Ryan Adams, Ben Queller, or Jim James from My Morning Jacket, all coming together to make a record with America. It's great. It's called Here and Now. Definitely worth checking out. Um, and then I get a call from Clive Davis, my friend, my client, my one-time uh, adversary. He's like, I have a new project for you. I want you to meet Simon Fuller. Now, Simon Fuller was the guy who created American Idol. So in 2006, I meet Simon Fuller, and I get his thumbs up to A&R Some American Idols, um, which for an A&R guy, whose job it is to connect the dots, that was a dream job for me. I ended up making seven or eight idol records. The first one was Chris Daughtry, and we had six weeks to make the record. And this is a great story. I don't know if any of you guys were fans back then of Idol, but that was the Chris Daughtry era Idol was like right at the crest of the popularity of the show. And the season before, there was a guy who came in second place, I think, named Bo Bice, who was like this long-haired southern rock dude, right? And the first time that I met Chris Daughtry, he said to me, dude, he said, you know, I'm really, really nervous. I've wanted to make a record my whole life, and this is my opportunity. I've been working in an auto dealership, right? But all I want to do is make music. I got on this television show, to ho hopefully, to give me that opportunity to make this a, a career, right? So, but you gotta, you gotta help me here because Bo Bice, the first rock guy to come off Idol, he's like, I listen to that record and it sucks. He's like, I've waited too long for this. My record can't suck. I'm like, all right, cool, no problem. Don't suck, got it, make, make it. Make it. <laughs> and he's like, you gotta make me a promise. I know we're just meeting but you gotta make me a promise that my record is not gonna suck. Shook his hand, I said, you got that promise, right? So then we had six weeks to make the record, because with an idol, they come off television in May, they go on tour July, August, September. If you're gonna hit the sweet spot of holiday season to sell records, you need the record out in November for Thanksgiving. So that basically gives me the month of September and October to make the record. And if the record's not gonna suck, you really gotta hustle, right? So we went all in. For Chris and we found great songs he wrote great songs the first time we met him he took out his guitar and he said to me and Clive do you mind if I played you a song I just wrote and he played the song called home and I'm like my job's done I don't need to touch that one you know um, and something you, you know you got to listen you got to know that's a hit that's not a hit right so um, with Chris we were able to, to do it we hired the right producer a guy named Howard Benson rock producer um, we found all the songs we made the record in six weeks and I love the record, Clive loved the record, Howard loved the record, Everybody, Chris loved the record, everybody loved the record. So to this day, we ended up selling five million copies, had seven singles, ton of hits, everything went right. A lot of projects that everything goes wrong, that one everything went right. But to this day, if you take out the Chris Daughtry record and you look inside the liner notes, which is something, unfortunately, in a digital universe, liner notes don't really exist anymore, but if you take out the CD and you look at the thank yous, there's a thank you to me and my buddy Ashley, who co and are the record with me, and it says, to Ash and Pete, thanks for doing what you promised and for making this record not suck. <laughs> <laughs> so, did Daughtry, did the guy, Daughtry didn't win that year. The guy who won was a guy named Taylor Hicks, did that record, and that didn't do as well. Um, ended up doing Kelly Clarkson's records, doing David Cook's record, the, the winner a couple of years later, and had a great time, did Seven Idol records, got to know that, that Camp Simon Fuller in 19 really well. Um, and really, really had a great time. Um, so a lot of what I do is based on relationships. If you're a record producer and I hire you to make a record for us at Atlantic and we have a great experience, you like working with me, I like working with you, and it's successful, I'm gonna hire you again, right? So this guy, Howard Benson, who, um, who produced the Daughtry record and prior to that had produced My Chemical Romance and All American Rejects and P.O.D., a bunch of great records and great bands. Um, Howard and I realized on the Daughtry record that his skill set and my skill set are a perfect match because my job is songs, his job is production. So what I would do is I would go out to all my songwriter friends and publishers and I would find the songs, get the songs right, key them up to Howard, and Howard would come into the studio. We didn't ha have time for Chris to put a band together back then, so we had to call Hired Guns. 
And so Howard put the band together, and he would take these songs that I helped deliver to the project and kill them as records, just kill them. So when that record was as successful as it was, we realized that, hey, this, this is a marriage that works, let's keep going. So I said to Howard, I'm gonna hire you for whatever projects make sense what, that I have. Why don't you do the same for me? So there were two records that Howard called me on. I called him to produce Kelly Clarkson and some other stuff. He called me on, um, he got a call one day from the chairman of Atlantic Records um, with a band, a rock band that Atlantic had signed called Hailstorm. And Hailstorm's a rock band from Philadelphia with a female singer. It's kind of like a modern day Pat Benatar, Joan Jett. And great band, great live band, they had no songs. So the chairman of Atlantic called Howard and said, can you produce this record? And Howard said, I can, but they have no songs. And the chairman said, well, if I hire you, can you find the songs? And Howard said, I don't do that, but I know somebody who does. So the chairman of Atlantic called me and said, hey, can I hire you to be an A&R consultant on this project, Hailstorm, and you'll find the songs and Howard will produce it. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. Little did I know at that point that the band had been signed for two and a half years, had been co-writing with professional songwriters for two and a half years, and had come up with a grand total of zero songs that of a hundred songs that they've written, none was good enough to make a record. So I did my thing, we came up with the songs, I went into Atlantic, played them the songs, and after four or five songs, the chairman of the company said, can you work here? And I said, no, but why don't you just keep hiring me on projects? This is what I do, I love what I'm doing right now, I'll keep finding you songs. And um, so Howard and I went on to make the Hailstorm record, which ended up doing really well, um, and a couple of things happened from there. Howard kept looking for projects for me, and Atlanta kept calling me. So Howard then calls me a couple of months later, and he's like, I got another one for you. There's a band called Train. And Train was kind of down to their last strike at the point. This was around 2007, 2008. And I met Pat Monahan, lead singer Train. And he literally said to me, he's like, I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing. He's like, I've lost the plot. I don't know what to do. And I said, let me help you. That's what I'm here for. I said, have you ever co-written a song for Train? He said, no. I've co-written a song for other projects. I've co-written a song for my solo project. Never for Train. I said, and this is where what I do for a living, you know, it's kind of like, you, you'll get the example. I said, Pat, what we've got to figure out here is, it's the same argument, this, the same example that I gave earlier with Santana. I said, there's an audience out there for Train. We've just got to know who they are. And we've got to give them a reason to give a shit again, right? Because the last Train album stiff, the Pat Monahan solo album stiff, you got one shot left. If the Train record doesn't work, Train's getting dropped, and you guys are going to become a nostalgia band. You know that, and I know that, right? Um, you're not getting it on the radio again. So I said, let me tell you how I think of it. I think of Train 10 years ago, in the late 90s, there was an 18-year-old woman in college, at the frat house on a Saturday night, getting drunk, having the best night of her life, and the music she's listening to is Meet Virginia by Train, right? Fast forward 10 years, that girl who still loves Train is now 28, she's a soccer mom, she's got two kids. She loves Train, but you've given her absolutely no reason to care. Let's make music aimed at that woman, right? So it's like, okay, cool, what do I do? I said, let me connect you with some songwriters, and let's give them that brief, right? <coughs> so I introduce him, the first co-write that we set up is I introduce him to a couple of friends of mine who had just had a big hit um, with me together on David Cook, The Idol. Um, these Norwegian writers named Amund and Espen, they call themselves Espionage, right? And, oh, it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> so Espionage, a writing duo, Norwegian, but living in New York. So I connect Pat with, <coughs> with Espionage, and it's the first <coughs> writing session. And I'm gonna show you how brilliant an a &R person I am in one second. <laughs> <laughs> so I put Pat in with Amden Espin, with Espionage, and they're writing. They're spending the day together. I figured since it's, you know, it's the first time that Pat's done this for train, let me go into the session, let me see how they're doing. So at around, you know, five, six o'clock, I walk down to the studio, and I go to Amund and Espen and Pat, and they're all in the control room with the guitars out. I said, how's it going? Amund says, great. 
Espen says, great. I said, Pat, how's it going? He's like, I need to talk to you right now outside. <laughs> what I didn't know then is Pat's a big practical joker. I had no idea, right? But I'm like, oh, shit. So we go outside, and Pat says to me, we got a big fucking problem, man. And I said, all right, what's the problem? And forgive me if I offend anybody with what I'm about to say, but you have to be in the moment and to appreciate the, uh, the joke here. It's like, espionage. And I'm like, yeah? He's like, that's a gay fucking name. <laughs> And I said, okay. He's like, I can't call them espionage. I just can't. And I said, all right. Do you have a name you want to call them? He's like, yeah, I want to call them the Norwegian homos. <laughs> I said, no problem. No problem. How's the session going? <laughs> He's like, oh, the song's great. No problem. Right? Mm -hmm. well, you're, you're an asshole. So <laughs> we, walk, <laughs> we, walk, we walk back in the studio <laughs> with the Norwegian homos. <laughs> and I said, let me hear the song you've written. And they play a song, it's called Brick by Brick. And I listen to the song. And I'm not usually one listen guy. I have to listen two or three or four times to really know inside and out every part of the song. And they play me the song, and I'm like, oh my God, you nailed it. The brief that I just gave you guys about the 18 year old girl who's now 28, who wants to you know, fall in love with training again, that's it. You just nailed it first time in, brick by brick, um, you know, we'll build it from the floor, we'll get, get back to a place stronger than before. It's a lyric about a relationship between a couple, it's also a relationship, it's a song about a relationship between Train and their audience. You know, this is absolutely brilliant. Keep going, write more, right? So the next day they get back in and here's the brilliant A&R part, right? I walk in, they're like, we got another one, let's play it for you, and they play me a song, I'm like, that's a piece of shit. That song was Hey Soul Sister, right? <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you got to know when you're right and when you're wrong and have a team around you. And they're like, no, we kind of like this one. We're going to keep going. I'm like, cool, you know. Song of the Year sold 7 million cents. <laughs> so a funny thing happened on the way to all that, right? So I'm doing all this. My anchor client as a consultant is still Clive Davis. What happens to Clive Davis? He gets fired again, right? So Clive was running J Records, he gets fired again. This is now going back to 2008. And I'm like, you know, I just don't have the stomach for this anymore because he's still my main client. And sure enough, as things would happen, I get a call from uh, the chairman of Atlantic Records, the guy who gave me the gig on the band Hailstorm. And he's like, I know you've turned me down before, but how'd you like to come in and head up the A&R department at Atlantic? And I said, you know, your timing may actually be okay. And that was around four years ago, and I've been the head of A&R at Atlantic ever since. Um, and I am very, very privileged to not only carry on the legacy of Ahmed Erdogan um, and help Atlantic move into the 21st century, but I've got a great, great staff of young A&R people, both male and female, who are a lot like me when I was, when I started. And um, one of them even came up with something a couple of weeks ago, and he played me a song. He's like, it's a hit. I'm like, yeah, it's a novelty song. You want Turtle Power again? You know? But um, my job is now not only to help the label sign the right artists and make the right records, but also help the A&R staff know what potholes to avoid, because I've hit them all. You know? And um, next year will be 25 years of my doing A&R, and I am as excited as I was to be doing it when you know I was a kid just starting out. So that's a little bit of my history over the last 25 years. Um, I know that Aram wanted to talk about how the industry is different now than it was back then. And Aaron and I were talking on the way over here that everyone talks about, oh my god, the music business is dead and the music industry is dinosaur. What's funny is that Atlantic Records, uh, for the year, the fiscal year, our business year that just ended at the end of September, we had the best year ever in the history of Atlantic Records, which you would think, well, how is that possible? People aren't buying music the way they used to. Everybody is stealing music, right? That's what we hear. Well, what you've got to do is you've got to get smart. And you've got to realize, well, yeah, it used to be in the old days that you would sell a record, you'd make 10 bucks a record, and you sell, you know, two million, three million, four million records, you can make a lot of money, right? 
Well, now, if somebody is not going to steal music, they're actually going to go out and purchase recorded music. They might buy a single. They might not buy an album, right? So you go to iTunes and you spend $1.29. And so we've now kind of looked at that business. For every 10 tracks that we sell, that's an equivalent album, right? So Hey Soul Sister, for example, sold over 6 million singles in America. Do the math, that's 600,000 albums, that's a lot of money, right? Bruno Mars, one of our artists, on his last album, he sold a million and a half albums just in America now, forget about the rest of the world, a million and a half albums, but also 14 million singles, which means another million and a half albums. So three million album equivalents total, it's a lot of money. The other thing that Atlantic is doing now that we did back in Ahmed's day is when we realized that people were pirating music, and that the sales, you know, when I was a kid, you'd go to a record store. Now you got to, like, you know, take out Google Maps to find one within 100 miles, right? Um, now we were realizing that, that the, the sales of, of, of physical, at physical retail were shrinking. Okay, we're going to sign you. You're no longer a producer. Now you're an artist, right? We're going to sign you. But, you know, you don't have anything going on right now. You're 17 years old, you have a great voice, maybe one song, maybe not. We're gonna give you our entire staff of 225 people who work at Atlantic Records in America, and we're gonna give everything we have to you, right? Everything. In exchange, we wanna be your partner because if we find you the right song, if we find you the right producer, if we book you on Saturday Night Live like we did with Bruno Mars last Saturday night, Anybody see the Pandora's sketch? How amazing is that, right? Um, if we, you know, get you to be the face of, you know, whatever brand retailer, you walk into, you know, a shoe store and you're on a poster, you know, if we do all that for you, we want to be your partner. So we started around seven or eight years ago at Atlantic doing different types of deals, deals called expanded rights deals. So now, we're not only going to be your partner when it comes to sale of recorded music, we're going to be your partner with everything because we're throwing so much money investing in you as an artist that we could lose everything we have. We could put millions of dollars in you and end up with zero, right? You could put out a record that doesn't sell. You could decide you don't want to do this anymore, that you'd rather be a nun. I, you know, I don't know, right? <laughs> so we said, look, we have to mitigate the risk here. Big risk, big reward. Let's all be partners. So starting with a band called Paramore, we became their partner, and they became our partner. And we held hands together and said to Haley Williams when she was 14 years old, hmm. we're all in this together, right? So now, she's got an amazing career, but we're her partner. When she goes and sells out the O2 Arena in London, we get a percentage of the ticket sales, of the t-shirts. If Haley is doing an endorsement deal, we get a percentage of the endorsement. If Haley is hired to, you know, star in a movie, we get a percentage of that. So we are partners with all of our bands now. So when you hear about the doom and gloom of the music business, don't believe the hype. You know, we're alive and we're healthy. So the other thing about, you know, music business, you know, it's very easy to say, well, the music that the major labels put out isn't music that I, you know, as a 20-year-old kid like. We're a business. we got to stay alive. Um, we are in the business of, you know, selling the most amount of music to the most amount of people. And if that's an artist like Skrillex, if that's an artist like Straight No Chaser, who's a collegiate a cappella group, doesn't matter. We're full service, right? So that's a little bit of State of the Union music business 2012, 2013. So we got around 25 minutes left. I would love to ask, you know, answer questions from everybody because again, if you guys are interested in pursuing a career in the music business, happy to answer those questions. If you want to know more about what the landscape is like, good, bad, you know, pretty ugly, I'm living, I'm living the wars every day. So, any questions? Uh -huh. Yeah, what's, um, what's your criteria for looking for a new project to work on if you have so many tools at your disposal? Like, if you can invest so much in making 
a band <coughs> to make it, what do you look for first? I think that it comes down to is this going to be meaningful, creatively, and profitable business wise, right? Because you have people who put out music either themselves or on behalf of their friends because they just love the music and they don't care whether they make money or lose money. We have 225 people employed by the label in America. We want to make sure that we can keep the lights on. So, you know, I love looking at the Atlantic roster because it's a very, very healthy, diverse roster. And hopefully, if you don't like A, you'll like B. If you don't like B, you'll like C. And it's a big world out there. You know, you can s sell music in America, but you can also sell it, um, not only the recorded music, but the tickets and the merch and all that all over the world. Ben? So, uh, hypothetically, say you're like me and you know you're incredibly talented musically. And uh, you're completely willing to sell out and go do whatever you got to do to make a pop hit. How do you get involved in that? How do you get? I, how you you get, I mean, you guys are very lucky. If, if you're a musician in 2012, you have all the tools at your disposal, which you know a generation ago you didn't have. So you could, um, you know, just by sitting in front of a, of, of a laptop, probably record a better quality demo than some of the masters that I used to make 20, 25 years ago. You know. Um, but what's important is the quality is the most important thing in terms of the actual song itself. If you're writing a song, you know, there's a difference between a song and a copyright. Copyright is the essence of the song, the published song that will exist for eternity, right? And you've heard of music publishers. Music publishers are in the business of owning copyrights. So think about any song, like, you know, your favorite song of all time. Somebody is the publisher of that song, which means that if you hear it on the radio, the songwriter and the publisher are getting paid. If you hear it in a movie, the songwriter, publisher are getting paid. If you, you know, buy a Christmas toy for your nephew and it plays that song, if it's a chattering monkey with symbols, plays that song, the songwriter and the publisher are getting paid. Some of the most famous songs of all time are not in the public domain. They are owned, copyrights that are owned. You know, the, the best example of a copyright that is owned, that you, you sing every day, Happy Birthday. That is a song where the copyright is owned by a major publishing company. So every time you hear Happy Birthday, a couple of pennies go down to the publisher. So my advice, having you know, lived this for the last 25 years, my advice is that if you're creating music, elevate that bar. Know the difference between Deuces Wild and Supernatural, right? Because we elevated the bar. We kept moving it higher and higher and higher. So how do, you, how do you decide, like you were saying before, there's certain artists that you pick up that have one song or no songs. Like how do you decide that they're worthy of it if you have someone else who's probably just as good singing and guitar-wise or whatever, but better at making songs themselves? I have an A&R staff of around 15, 20 people, right? Because I started at Atlantic, and now I oversee more than just Atlantic. I oversee Fuel by Ramen, I oversee Roadrunner, I oversee Photo Finish. So it's like a big roster. Roster slots are very precious. I also have around 15 to 20 A&R people who work for me um, throughout the country for those labels. And I want to see from them, I want to see insane passion, where it's like, I have a new artist. I need you to sign, I need you, meaning, you know, the head of the department, to bless the signing of this new artist, or else, there she is, then I think about it. or else, not only am I not going to sleep at night, but, you know, I'm going to lose 100 pounds, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be a wreck. And my, you know, my criterion is like, are you ready to lose your job for this artist? And if the answer is yes, all right, if I hear what you're hearing, let's sign it. If the answer is, oh, I didn't know I was thinking like that, you know, then it's like, slots are very, very precious. There's also, there's a lot of good, not a lot of great. It's our job to kind of differentiate between good and great. And again, great is relative. You know, you listen to Gangnam Style, is that great? Classic. <laughs> you know, millions of people love that song, you know. So it's our job to know, okay, maybe it's not aesthetically brilliant in, in you know in the way that a Bob Dylan lyric is aesthetically brilliant but you know 
who doesn't like to go like this and go like that? <laughs> How critical is it to have success right away? Like, you know, there's a lot of bands and artists who grew as, you know, they gain experience on their second, third, fourth album. You have to Are be, you guys willing to still grow with bands or artists? Yeah, I, th like I, I think you have to be. And one of the things I like about my boss, the guy who runs the, the chairman of the label, is he's very patient. Going back to that um, example I gave you before of the rock band Hailstorm, um, I've said to him on multiple occasions, I said, it's unbelievable that you had the patience not to drop this band. Because, you know, you have reviews every couple of months. Okay, who can we drop? The roster's too big, it's always too big. Who can we drop? Let's make room for more, right? Exa a better example. Um, a year or two before I got to the label, there was a rock band signed to Atlanta called From First to Last, not From First to Last, Sun uh, Sonny Moore, who was the singer from From First to Last. I listened to Sonny Moore's demos, they were horrible. And some of my guys, some of my better guys who have like the best ears in the company would say, this is a joke, we gotta drop this guy, this is awful. My boss was like, patience, patience. And Sonny Moore would send his music in and he would say, hey, I'm ready to go, let's put out a Sonny Moore record. We would say, not so fast, keep going, keep writing, keep writing. This went on for a year, Sonny Moore got really, really upset, frustrated, angry. Turns out, he channeled his frustration into a new style of music. And I liken it to Clark Kent going into a phone booth and coming out as Superman. <laughs> Sonny Moore went into a phone booth and came out as Skrillex, right? So you gotta be patient. Because sometimes, if I'm signing an artist who's 17 years old, they have no idea who the hell they are, right? You know there's talent there, but it's gonna take a minute. You look at some of the great artists of all time, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, R.E.M., U2, took them two, three, four, five albums, you have to have the patience. And here's another great thing, if you don't have the patience, you have to be able to be the guy on the other end who's ready to get the rebound, right? So if like a bunch of record labels out there and you shoot and you miss, and you're Columbia Records and you shoot and you miss, I gotta be there to get the, get the rebound, right? So there was one, one day at Columbia Records around 10 years ago, where in one day they dropped Alicia Keys, they dropped One Republic, they dropped 50 Cent, like they dropped the Jonas Brothers, all in one day, right? That's a hell of a lot of rebounds for me to get, right? But you gotta be ready. So for example, some of the biggest breakthrough artists on the Atlantic roster right now were all rebounds. Wiz Khalifa, signed to Warner Brothers Records. Nobody cared. He got dropped. When he got dropped, kind of figured out who he is. He's like, maybe I should smoke more weed. <laughs> <laughs> there was a band called The Format. The Format were signed to Electra Records. Didn't make sense. The lead singer in The Format is like, this isn't working for me. I know why this is not successful. I'm going to start a new band. Electra dropped him. He went into a phone booth. The format became fun. We signed him to Feel by Ramen. Biggest new artist breakthrough of the year, right? Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars was signed to Motown Records. Record never came out. He learned how to write songs after he got <coughs> dropped from Motown. He's like, maybe my songs aren't good enough. Maybe I can't do it myself. So he brought in Ari Levine. He brought in, um, um, you know, Phil and Ari. They became um, Philip Lawrence. They called themselves the Smeezingtons. They learned how to write songs. We signed Bruno and said, hey, Bruno, before we put out a Bruno record, why don't we take one of your great songs and give it to a couple of our artists here, and you can feature. So, nothing on you. B.O.B. featuring Bruno Mars. Travi McCoy. Um, what's the song? Billionaire. Billionaire, right? That's Bruno's hook. <coughs> Same thing. So, you got to be patient, and you got to be smart. And you got to say, okay, Bruno, we're not going to put your record out right now. But we're going to put your song out, we're going to get your name on the radio, and then when you're ready to drop just the way you are into Grenade, they're going to be ready for you. Right? It's really an amazing business. I would not want to do anything else. Uh, you know, despite all the bloody firings that I just described, um, I think I have the greatest job in the world. Go ahead. I know you've had a lot of successes with different artists, but have you had any disappointments that you weren't too mad about because you learned something something? Yes. I'll give you an example. Thank you for asking. Um, when I was still fairly new, I found a band. Um, 
I doubt anyone here would know who the band is. They're an Irish rock band from a bunch of Irish expats living in New York in the early 90s. And they call themselves Black 47, <coughs> right? Still around, still play um, Irish bar called Conley's on most Saturday nights. Great band to see. And at the time, they, had, um, they were finishing a record that they were recording with a guy named Rick Ocasek, who was the lead singer of the band The Cars. Great band. And they were doing these legendary New York shows every Saturday night that would go on for hours and hours and hours at a small Irish pub called Patty Riley's on 28th Street and 2nd Avenue. And I went down to one of these shows, and it was like life-changing. This guy, the, the lead singer, songwriter of the band, was somewhere across between, <coughs> anybody remember the great Irish band, The Pogues? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Across between The Pogues and Bruce Springsteen. It was like that urban poetry with, you know, bagpipes and tin whistles. It was unbelievable. You know, a, a bit of what Gaslight Anthem is doing now, but imagine if Gaslight Anthem mashed up with Dropkick Murphys. That's what it sounds like, right? Amazing and, like, life-changing. And so I went Friday night, I went Saturday night, I went Sunday night. Every time the guy looked out in the audience, there I was, right? I was just obsessed. So a bunch of labels wanted to sign him. He ended up signing with me. Why? Because we showed the most passion, right? Put out the record, we sold around 125, 150,000 albums. Good start, right? Then he's ready to make his next record. And there is an old adage in the music business where an artist has their entire life to write their first album. And maybe around six months to write their second album. That's why second albums are hardly ever as good as first albums, right? So he sends me the demos for the second album. And I listen to him and I hate him. But I love this band so much. And the guy's a lot older than me and he's my friend. And I don't want to get in a fight with him. Because I know if I tell him that I don't like his songs, we're going to have a big problem. You know, he's going to say, um, you know, I don't agree with you, and I want to make my record with these songs. I don't care what you think. And that's exactly what happened. And I had a decision to make. Do I say, I'm going to stand my ground because your songs aren't ready, and I don't care if you hate me for the rest of your life. It's for you and your band's own good. Because, again, I'm holding the, the checkbook. You know, if we're going to spend $200,000 making your record, I'm on the line for it on behalf of my record company. So I've got to be a hard ass. I've got to be the bad guy, right? So I had this moment back then where I could stand my ground and say no and be hated by this guy, or I could keep him as my friend and say, okay, you're probably right. And unfortunately, at the young, impressionable age that I was at the time, when I was too nice, I did the latter. And I let him go in and make the record. And the album flopped. And the band has never recovered. He does not see it that way. And he actually wrote his memoir. And he blames me on page 97 of the book for ruining his career. But that's another story. Um, so yes, I, I learned the hard way that that will never happen to me again. Never happen to me again. And I love when my bands like me, but I have enough friends. At this point in my life, I don't need more. Go ahead. Uh, you spoke about like certain producers and songwriters that you like to work with. Um, where do you feel like your responsibility as A and R in the like studio is? Like, do you see yourself as like sort of management, like to come in and like keep people on track? Or, like, all all A and R people are different. Like the guy who signed Skrillex, his job is to take Sonny's vision and make sure that Sonny's vision does not get fucked with. Right. My job is basically to go to my artists and say, you don't have enough songs. You know, every artist is different. You know, if I sign Bob Dylan, I don't know if I would tell Bob Dylan, you know, blown in the wind, eh, I don't know. Go back, maybe, you know, blown in the rain. Maybe try that. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not, but you never know, right? So um, every A&R person approaches their job differently. I'm very hands-on. And the producers and the writers that work with me know that. And I've gotten a bit of a reputation, for better or for worse, as being a bit of a hard ass. But I would rather take a song that's a B plus and make suggestions to the artist, the producer, and the songwriter to turn it into an A plus than, you know, again, like we were just talking about, be the artist's best friend. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. So, 
So much of what you're talking about is about listening, listening to a song. Uh, what what do you listen for when you're listening to a song, and how do you think about the audience when you're listening to this? I always think about the audience when I'm listening to a song because. Again, on behalf of Atlantic Records, I need to make sure that if we're putting something out, there is an audience there who's going to be ready to receive it. And listening to music, for me, is a very, very intense process. And I wish I could listen to music like in the background while I was vacuuming and whistling. You know, that, I'm not that guy. I listen to music, and I do most of my listening in my car. I have to drive, um, you know, an hour to and from work every day. And I like listening in the car because when I get to the office, you know, people are running into the office and their meetings and their phone calls and um, it's very hard to concentrate. In the, um, in the car, it's easy to concentrate. So the problem <laughs> is that by the time I get to work, I'm exhausted because I've just spent an hour, hour and a half listening to songs one, two, three, four times, studying lyrics, um, you know, deciphering arrangements, having to figure out, you know what? You know your bridge there? That bridge is really a chorus. And your chorus sucks. You know, so it's basically that's, I'm always listening, trying to figure out if there's a mass audience out there for this artist and this song, what's missing? And what can we do to help, um, you know, to help the, uh, help this song reach that audience? How do you think you develop that skill? years and years and years of listening and years and years of making decisions both wrong and right. So, uh, you know, we're, nobody is right 100% of the time. Clive Davis is not right 100% of the time. Ahmed Erdogan wasn't right 100% of the time. But the more you do it, the more you get a sense of, of what could work. And then it's always a roll of the dice. I made a record a couple of years ago, a rock band I thought was great. The, um, you know, two weeks into the tour, the lead singer got into a bar fight. <coughs> and the guy he was fighting with crushed his larynx. That's beyond my control. I can make the record. I can't go defend you in a bar fight, you know? <laughs> There's real life out there that's going to happen beyond what I can control. If his larynx had been pristine, would he have been you know, platinum artist right now? I have no idea, but he had a better shot there than you know, with a voice that didn't work. So, what time? 4.10, right? 14. So we got 10 minutes. I'm digging this. More questions? Anybody? Go ahead. You seek outside help? I'm sorry? You seek outside help when you listen to a band. Like no, psychology, just... therapy? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mean like that? What kind of outside help? Like when you know, when you're on the, on the fence of whether you think, you know, it's just like worth your time. Yeah, um, I like to solicit other people's opinions, but I always trust my own more than anyone else. Um, the tendency in a and &R, it's very easy to go with the flow of the room. Because when we were sitting in Clyde Davis's office, he would play a song, and he would literally go around the room. And he didn't want to know if you liked it or you didn't like it. He wanted you to assign a number value to that song between zero and 10, right? Zero was the worst song ever, 10 was the best song ever. And usually a seven was a song that was good enough to make an album, not become a single. An eight was a single, nine was a smash, right? So he would go around the room. What do you think? Seven. What do you think? Eight. What do you think? And then the guy would get cute. 7.75, you know, like <laughs> shit like that, right? And so it's very easy to, if you're going last, everyone else said it was a seven, I'll say it's a seven too. What's harder is to be an individual, right? And to really say what's on your mind. There's an old joke. How many ANR people does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> right? So, you have, to be, you have to be ready to be wrong, but you have to have the power of your own conviction. Right? So I have to be able to go in there and say, I think that song, Hey Soul Sister, sucks. Because that's how I honestly felt at the time. Because uh, you know, sometimes the, the success or failure of a record defies A&R logic, right? So when you listen to a lyric that says, hey, soul sister, that's Mr. Mister on the radio, and like a virgin, you're Madonna, you're like, your cornball meter goes off, and it's like, really? You know, but sometimes people like, guy yeah, doesn't stop you know, it's the same thing. So, a couple of minutes left, any other questions? 
um, when you are listening to music, you, you're the head of a lot of different labels and stuff. So do you have like you have certain people, like you say you're listening for the audience. Um, how hard is it to gauge that? Because you have like Feel by Ramen, which might be more alternative rock audience, which might be different from. But then Fun is a band that's broken to mainstream. You, you have to know you have to know who the audience is, right? If I'm listening to a record for Bob, you know, it's going to be you, you know that it's a different audience than you know. Ti's audience, or for Kid Lock's audience, or for Straight No Chasers' audience. Um, Feel by Ramen. We just signed this incredible new band. They're called Twenty One Pilots. They're from Columbus, Ohio, and in Columbus, Ohio, they sell close to three thousand concert tickets. Even though outside of Columbus, nobody knows who they are yet. Their album hasn't come out yet. And for them, musically, it's a combination of alternative rock, pop hip-hop, it's like everything that these kids grew up on, they're putting into their music. And so when I listen to that, I'm like, I don't know what this is, but I know it's great. And so my job is to help, if there's an arrangement issue, if there's a structural flaw in one of the songs, to be able to question the band. And you know, they, they sent the song in, it didn't have a chorus. And I'm like, that's interesting. All it had was a piano that went da 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 that was it. No chorus. And I was like, why don't we write some lyrics there over that melody? And he did, and we listened, and I'm like, go back to the da 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 da, but maybe the third time you do it, instead of just the piano, maybe whistle it. And that's what he did, and the record's killer now, you know? So you gotta be ready to kind of like throw all, you know, all comparisons aside and just go with the moment of what you're listening to and say, hey, at the end of the day, are more people going to like this or not like this? And, you know, on behalf of Atlantic, I want that to be the former, not the latter, you know? There's always room for experimental music. There's always room for, you know, cool hipster pigeons and plain 